Test. Test, test. Mr. Tucker, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. We just wanted to test the connection. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank right. you. Bye.
Good evening, Kershaw County citizens that are here with us in person and watching online. This is the March 26th regularly scheduled County Council meeting, and I call this meeting to order. First agenda item tonight is our invocation. This will be delivered by Pastor Rosalyn Watson. Hi, Miss Watson. Thank you for being here. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, Rosalyn Watson, pastor of House of Prayer Ministry in the Dusty Bend area of Camden. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you because of the people of Kershaw County and everything in this county belongs to you. Father God, we need good leaders to come from you, Lord. This nation needs leaders with discerning hearts and wise minds. We come to you today asking you to give us wise leaders that will lead this county in the right direction. Remove wrong people that are corrupt and living against your word from influential positions. Let our leaders be people who honor your holy name, for it is only from you that they will get true wisdom. It is in the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior that we believe and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And Mr. Tucker, are you on the line? Yes, Madam Chair, I am. And you have to give me just a few seconds because I got you muted um, to come off, but I am online. Okay, thank you. Miss um, Hannah, let the record show that Mr. Tucker is online with us. Mr. Shoemake will be late. He is working in Greenville today. So if he joins us, it will be late. All right, up to item number four, adoption of tonight's agenda. Are there any motions pertaining to a night's, tonight's agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion um, <laughs> to adopt tonight's agenda with two amendments. Okay, motion to adopt with two amendments. What are the amendments, Mr. Tomlinson? Um, I move that we amend the agenda to add an additional executive session item, uh, receipt of attorney-client privilege, legal briefing regarding land development regulations pursuant to SC Code 30-4-70A2. And okay. also, do I need, can I include the next one in my motion? Yes. Okay. Also, I would like to make a motion that we strike and remove 8D ordinance first reading of case 2407. Okay. Motion to approve the agenda with two amendments, adding executive session, Charlie under item 12, and striking eight delta. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, second by Mr. Cato. Any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Tucker. You have to split those. It takes a two-thirds vote on one and a simple majority on the other. Say again, Mr. Tucker. You need to split those amendments because one is deleting and one is adding. It takes a two-thirds majority vote on one, and then the other is a simple majority, please. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Um, Thomason, can you I'll, split well, those yes, two will, separate motions? I will redo my motion. Um, motion number one, I move to amend the agenda um, with a motion to add the executive session C, receipt of legal advice covered under attorney-client privilege. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that motion. Okay, second by Mr. Cato. Any discussion on adding an executive session item tonight? Okay, all those in favor of the addition to 12 Charlie adding executive session indicate by raising your hand. Okay, Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote on adding executive session yes. item? Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Yep. All um, right, please add Charlie to item number 12. Madam Chair, my next amendment. Okay. Um, I move to amend the agenda tonight to strike and remove ordinance 8D, uh, first reading of case 2407 from the agenda. Okay, motion to strike 8 Delta. Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, second by Mr. Cato into discussion. Um, I do have an email from the owner of the property and he is wishing to withdraw his rezoning case. So that's why we're striking this item. 
Any questions or discussion on that strike? The Elgin. Yes. The Elgin property, correct. Yes, it's um, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of Kershaw County to rezone 23.4 acres owned by Largacy Limited Performance LLC, co-owned by George Delk, located on the east side of Ross Road with the addresses of 1512 Ross Road and 132 Golden Pine Trail in Elgin, South Carolina from R15 Low Density Residential District to R6 High Density Residential District. He has requested we remove that um, rezoning application. Yes, if I could, please, I'd like to say that I spoke yes, with absolutely. Mr. Delk as well as I think some other council members, and he's a good guy. He's a he's a straight up straight up guy, and he understood that the community was not in favor of this, so he withdrew it. So I, I, I thank him for that, and I thank all the folks that are here too, that are concerned about the direction we're going with uh, growth in the county. Thank you for so much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, any other discussion? Okay. All right, all those in favor of striking eight delta from tonight's agenda indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Brazel, myself, Mr. Cato, Mr. Tomlins, and Mr. Jones. And Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, that amendment passes. Please strike eight delta. And now to adoption of the rest of the agenda. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of adopting the agenda as amended indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Brazel, myself, Mr. Cato, Mr. Thomas, and Mr. Jones, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote on adoption of the agenda? Vote yes, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, this is our new agenda. Up to number five, public comments. Mr. DeBose, can you hand me that sign-in sheet, please? So that, while that's coming up here, if you are here tonight to speak on that case, 2407, when I get to your name, if you'd still like to speak, absolutely, please come to the podium. Um, if you no longer wish to, I certainly don't want to waste anyone's time, but we will not be voting on that rezoning tonight. Um, it, the rezoning application has been withdrawn. Yes. We won't be voting on it, period. Yeah. Uh, we won't be voting on it, period, unless the applicant applies for another rezoning of the property. All right, the first speaker tonight is Kenneth Parker. And Mr. Tucker and council, there are 18 speakers signed up for county or for public comments tonight. You you read my mind. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I, Kenneth. Hey, how y'all doing? Well, since it's not going, can we leave? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You, 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 can, you, you can stay right. or leave. It's up to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Parker. The next speaker is Karen Boone. Hi, Karen, how are you? Good. Uh, I want to say thank you, and I'm so happy that that was withdrawn. But I do have a question. Yes. If he does um, uh, apply for another rezoning, will it, it'll have to be posted again, I'm assuming, so we'll be able to see that in our area. Could we give the attorney to give a legal update on that? Yes, um, for everyone that's here. So, Karen, we don't usually respond during public comments, but this is kind of an extenuating circumstance. So, Mr. DeBose, if you'll thank give you, us you, all an update. Correct. If a, if a rezoning is applied for, a subsequent rezoning, it'll go through the entire process that this one did. It'll go to Planning Commission. Same notices would occur in the paper, same physical postings of the property, same notices to neighboring property owners. Yes. All right. Thank you all so much. Yes, ma'am. The next speaker is Anthony Fullerton. Hi, Anthony. Good evening, Madam Chairman, Council Members. I'd like to make a brief uh, comment in reference to this rezoning withdrawal. We appreciate uh, the withdrawal, but one of the concerns that I have is this. Even though he's withdrawn this proposal, without any permission or any permits, he's already came along, representatives of whoever he hired, filled in all the drainage ditches in front of the property, backing water up into my property, which violates the federal riparian right laws. I went to the highway department 
to have them reopen the ditches. The highway department chief engineer informed them to cease and desist and re-establish the ditches. They also filled in the detention pond that was holding water because that place does flood out. Since then, they've dumped over 3,000 tons of backfill dirt in there, once again, without a permit. And when they, back, when they informed me, when I informed them they were backing up water on my property, they informed me that they owned the property. I said, no, that's, that, them ditches are in the highway right away, and you need a permit to do anything in the highway right away. That went past them, so I went to the <coughs> chief engineer in Park Street. He told them to cease and desist and reestablish the ditches. But even though with no permit, he's come in and dumped over 3,000 tons of dirt on that property. And the reason I know it's over 3,000 tons, first of all, I, I worked as a civil engineer for 40 years. There's over 150 almost 200 loads of dirt in there. Each load is 20 tons, five loads 100 tons, 50 loads 1,000 tons. So if you got 300 in there, you're talking hundreds of thousands of tons of backfill. So if we're not gonna do nothing, why are we backfilling in this property? And why don't we have any permits? I mean, every other contractor in, in America has to buy the permits so that the county can the county and appropriate regulations are being met. <coughs> so it seems like these people aren't looking for a permission. They think it's easier to operate and hope for forgiveness. <coughs> and so I think that still needs to be addressed just because they said, we're not gonna continue on with this project that they've addressed in reference to the high density housing. Why are we putting 3,000 tons of dirt out there? And where is the permit for it? All permits need to be requested through the county. They need to be posted during the, con the duration of the construction. It's never been posted. In fact, there's zoning signs that were installed they, by county law in reference to having them posted for 30 days. <laughs> the people in Ross Road just found out about this project within the past several days because the signs were taken down on Ross Road. We went hunting. My neighbour went hunting. My son went hunting on the right of way to see where the sign is, to see if it was knocked down. It's not grass cutting season, so I mean, there ain't no tractors knocking nothing. Where is the signs? That makes me very suspect, considering the previous dealings I've had with these people. And it still concerns me, even though they don't, they want to uh, withdraw the request for zoning. Why are we investing over $150,000 worth of dirt in the approach, into that place, <laughs> and we're doing nothing? So it seems to me that there is construction going on, no grading permits. On two different occasions, they, they should have had a grading permit. They never had any permits from the highway to fill in the ditches to do work on the highway right away. That's why I'm suspect about just because they say we're not going to do it. What comes next? And that's my concern. And I appreciate your time. And I appreciate the, the decline to pursue this too, that's obvious. Because my property is the longest contiguous property to this property. Another thing that concerns me where they have all this dirt that they're dumping in there, they're dumping construction trash in there. Mr. Fullerton, I'm so sorry, but you are out of time. I have your address as 1540 Ross Road, yes, is that correct? Okay, and I also have your phone number. Okay. Uh, Mr. Templer, can uh, you please you take time. a note to call him tomorrow and get some of his concerns addressed with the permits and the, his ditches? Yes. The administrator you, will call you. Yes, sir. Council members, thank you for your time. The next speaker is John Britton. Hi, John. Hey. 
First, I want to say thank you for allowing us to speak, and thank you uh, for <coughs> taking this off your agenda. And Brother Jimmy, good to see you, and thank you for the, uh, those remarks. And I hope... Well, they did it. Right. Thank you. And so I, I, I wanted to ask one question. Did, John, did each of you get my email that I sent you? I, on Friday the 22nd, uh, I had my daughter to do it, and she sent an email for me with what I wanted to say to each and every one of you council members. And so if you didn't, check your email and see what I had to say. I just wanted to let you know that I'm a long-time resident in that area, 50 years, and so uh, we really uh, want to keep that as a residential area for single-family dwellings, and I hope that we can see it and see it grow in that area. Thank you all so much. God bless you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. All right, the next speaker is Jenny Benning. Hi, Jenny. Did I say your last name right? Okay. How do you say it? Baining. Okay. And rotate that microphone down so that we can catch your audio. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you for the decision and wanted everybody to know my property is at the end of Ross Road at Highway 1. If anybody knows anything about that area, it's terrible. The traffic is terrible. I have wrecks at least once a week. You can check to see if that's true because it's terrible. Nobody pays attention coming over the hill into Elgin because everybody's turning onto Ross Road now because of what is already there. So I just want to say thank you because we don't need any more traffic. Um, I can't cut my grass in my ditch, therefore I can't have grass in my ditch. I have to kill it with poison. And they put a, I guess you call it a caution sign at the, there's a sign above, but it's still where everybody stops in that area that hasn't seemed to do any good. Um, they've been on the, had the news come out there and ask us, so it, it, it's a problem already. And Ross Road is very short, and it's split by a railroad tracks that makes it really that much shorter. We don't need any more traffic there. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Marilyn Kane. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you, for me to speak tonight. Thank you for taking the rezoning off the petition. I'm glad that the owner did withdraw. Miss Kane, can you raise the microphone a little so we can hear you better? Yep, thank you. Thank you for not for us not having to vote on this, or you not having to vote on this. We are glad that the committee listened to the neighborhood and the community. And as the previous uh, community member stated, there is a problem at Highway 1 in Ross Road. Every time I travel Highway 1 coming home, I literally turn on my turn signal at the furniture store so that I can get the traffic or the person following behind me to back off. It's been too many traffic accidents on that highway. Do we need a stop, maybe a traffic light? Maybe. Is it gonna cause more traffic problems? Yes. Along with Ross and Watson Road, every day whether me and my husband is walking out for exercise we watch the traffic go up and down that highway. I would imagine they're going like 70 miles per hour, speeding. You can't even be out there safe. You have to literally get all the way off the road because you're afraid you're gonna get hit. So we literally have to walk in the community and stay off in the grass. It's a concern. 
I have voiced it to the Kershaw Police Department on our walks, and they specifically stated to me it's, we're not in the city limits, so they can't come down on our end. Adding more traffic and rezoning to a R6, it just brings more traffic. I'm afraid of crime coming to the area. By our community having a swimming pool, if no swimming pool, if they decide to put apartments, if he requests a rezoning again, that just means kids coming over to our area, more problems, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kane. Right, the next speaker Madam, is- Madam Chair, could you yes, ask sir. Mr. Temple, because you're dealing with a federal road, a state road, to maybe follow up and-, and I wrote that down. I was going to um, get through public comments um, just to see if there were some other traffic concerns that people had. And then. Uh, and I apologize. Didn't yep. mean to jump ahead of you. Mr. Templer, go ahead and make a note um, so you and I get on that tomorrow. Request SCDOT take a look at Ross Road and Highway 1, please. The next speaker is Andrew Beck. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Pass? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. The next speaker is. Renald Johnson. Reginald, I'm sorry. Reggie, okay. Hi, Reggie. So you'll have to move the microphone up. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's a lot better, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we just moved to the area fairly recently. Um, my wife is from South Carolina. And, um, uh, her brothers, they went to the Citadel, and one went to the University of South Carolina. And um, her older brother went to the Citadel. Uh, he has macular degeneration, lost his eyesight. So my wife wanted us to move. So I went out to Lowe's. I bought a for sale sign and put it in front of the house. So we came here just to you know, help family and do what's right. However, after building our house, the owners of the lot, which is next door to us, and the builder cooperated together to blatantly circumvent the permitting laws by even prior to the permit being approved from Kershaw County, they actually demolished the topography of the lot next door to us, which is about it's elevated, so it's about 20, 20, you know, about 20 feet above us, right? And they actually signed indicating that they will get the correct permits from DHAC. However, they blatantly refused to do that as well. As a result of that, our property, it's infected a good part of the community, However, our, pop, our property, during mo through most of that building process, you call them, you're talking about months, has become their retention basin. There are a couple times that I felt we would have to go out and buy a boat to leave our property. That's how bad it was. Right. What I'm trying to express is that, for the most part, the accountability for folks who do that, based on what could actually happen end to end, is not even close to what it should be. And I know the, the engineers are diligently working on this. DHEC is pursuing this matter as best as they possibly can or as fast as they possibly can. However, there should be some type of notification process in place that notifies everyone who's involved, especially the financial institutions. Because from what I understand and what I've researched, and I've called my insurance professional, that once a building has been built without the correct permitting, the insurance company has the right to cancel the policy with an effective date as of the start date of that policy. And once they've done that, you can probably never get insurance again.
which creates another problem when you talk about it end to end. If you have individuals who go on that property or in that property, or whether they're a welcome individual or invited individual, or an uninvited guest, which would be, you know, postal workers, carriers, people like that, meter readers, and they get hurt and they want to make a claim against their property, and the insurance company finds out, oh, the correct permitting was not in place, they do not have to honor the claim. And they can just cancel out the policy. That's why it should go from end to end. There should be some type of process in place to make sure that everyone who could be impacted is notified. And the banks wouldn't be too happy about that either. They would call, they would call that uh, possibly something like, you know, begin with an F, ends with a D. I used to be a vice president J.P. Morgan Chase before I, you know, left there. I was there for 23 years. But just understanding what's took place, it just, it just doesn't make good sense to me that there isn't more teeth in, in, you know, at the county level to hold these folks accountable. Well, thank you for letting me speak. Yes, sir. Are, are you finished? Okay. I <laughs> just wanted to make sure you were finished. I didn't want to cut you off. That's, that's what I was saying. Thank you yeah. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, could you? Well, I wanted to make sure we have your address, 832 Hunter Hill Road. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And okay. my mobile number is there. Okay, and we have your mobile number. Uh, Mr. Templer, I see him writing something. Will you, write that, will you add that one to the list? Please do some research on that and then let council know what you find out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I think there's some folks that don't realize how the public speaking works. They're waiting for us to say something. If you could briefly. Yes, absolutely. Some of the rules. So um, public comment is a time for council to receive input. It's not a dialogue. We don't answer questions or respond. Um, so if you see me um, sitting here kind of stoic, that's why. Um, it's not a dialogue between council. It's just a time for us to receive information. Uh, we don't tolerate inappropriate language or um, inappropriate comments towards council members or any citizen in this county. Do you want me to read the rules? About the entire book. Okay. <laughs> We usually do that, so my apologies. All right, public comment guidelines. Public comments is an opportunity for members of the public to share information with council. It's not a time for debate or questions for council to answer. It's a time for council to receive input, and it is not a time for council response. In short, public comments will, county council will listen to public comment, but not comment. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right, the next speaker is Bill Kistler. Hi, Bill. Uh, is that how you say your last name, Kistler? Kistler, yeah. okay. That's right. That's right. Well, um, from what I just heard, they said they dropped everything and we're not going for R6, so that's good news. But what I did not hear, I guess y'all could send it to me on my mail it to me or call me or whatever it is that you can do since you can't answer the question is, how long before he could possibly or anybody could possibly reapply to do this? That's just my one question. That's just a concern I'd like to know because uh, like it was said earlier, somebody said they didn't even see the posting. I never saw a posting on Ross Road. I did see a posting on Watson Street. So that was just a concern. I'd like to know. And like you said, you can't answer questions. So, But if you could get that back to me, I would like to know. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kistler. So you. I wrote both those questions down and someone, and if it's not one of us, I'll have the administrator well, get back to you. Time. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, to end the public speaking, I would certainly support if you want to get some clarification on a couple of the questions for them tonight. Okay. It, but you, you would have to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next speaker is Carol. Okay, I think it's um, Buett. 
Hi, Carol. Barnett. Barnett. My apologies. How are you? Okay. We have similar um, Ms. Barnett, can you put the microphone, just rotate it down so it's closer, we can pick up your audio. Yes. Thank you. Um, I live across the street from Reggie, so mine is sort of along the same line. Same problem with the same builder. Um, my statement is to the best of my recollection. August 21st, 2023, I filed a formal complaint with the county concerning the problem of erosion onto my property from 823 Hunter Hill Road after repeated attempts over a three-week period to get both the owner as well as Randy Bach and Christine Bach to do something about the problem of erosion. Not only did they ignore the problem, they were belligerent. On August 29th, 23, 2023, a stop work order was issued on 823 Hunter Hill Road. Despite the stop work order, eight windows were installed. The work order was lifted even though there was no protection put in place on the back half of my property in terms of the erosion, not even a silt fence. It has been seven months since my first complaint. The back half of my property is still suffering the consequences of erosion. The most recent stop work order was put in place Friday, March 22nd, and on Sunday, March 24th, the workers arrived around 8 a.m. and left around, well, left exactly, at 6.41 p.m. This means they were working at the property approximately 10 consecutive hours despite the stop work order. Some of it was on the outside of the property, which we, they were certainly encouraged to be working on, and a good bit of that time was inside the property. The erosion has gone down as far as 841 Hunter Hill Road, which is three doors down from 823 Hunter Hill Road. At the current time, there are no consequences that are enforced if a stop work order is violated. I am requesting that the council put consequences in place that are strong enough to support the stop work order. I'm also asking that the council recognize Stephen Staley appropriately. He has stood by me throughout this tedious process within the limits of his job, and I am very grateful for his support. I would very much like to see some teeth put behind stop work orders. At the present time, they mean nothing. And the builder knows that. So the Johnstons, as well as myself, have been having to deal with this for quite some time. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. Thank you. All right, Mr. Templer, add that. I think it's the same property, but we need to um, get resolution on this tomorrow. We're already working on okay. it. Okay, thank you. Today. And point of order, Madam Chair, with, yes. with individual Mr. Jones. It, it point of order with individual names. Point of order with individual, individual names? Individual names being mentioned. Per, per our rules, if we want to change the rules, I'd be glad to change the rules, but as rules state, we're not and supposed Mr. to. Mr. Jones is referring to the speaker calling individuals we can't, names. And I didn't want to interrupt because in I wanted to hear what she had to say. Um, she, okay. she spoke very well. But Offensive and inappropriate comments will not be tolerated. If a group would like to speak, we request that a spokesperson be selected. Public comment is a time to discuss issues. Public comment is limited to five minutes maximum per speaker. Public comments to council as an agenda item shall continue uninterrupted and be live streamed by audio and video until public comments agenda item is finished or concluded. So I don't think the speaker violated our okay. rules. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Make sure that, that people can call our names too. I want to, I want to make sure that if, if, if we I do allow it, yes. Okay, very good. Um, not in an inappropriate way, though. Gotcha. The next speaker is Tom Webb the Third. Hi, Tom. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, Miss Krishanda Torres is going to approach the podium, and Mr. Tom Webb the Third, I'm going to put you in Krishanda's spot. Yes. Thank you Hi, so Ms. Torres. No problem. Good evening, Council. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing for the community with 
uh, withdrawing that uh, application. So I'm gonna be brief as always. Um, I have some information to share with you and to share with Kershaw County. Um, first, sorry, I have to bring it up. Okay, so the public is invited, including council members, to attend a six-week workshop, which will provide attendees with a practical, common-sense understanding of how the Constitution was intended to limit government and not the citizens. This class is called The Constitution is the Solution. We hold this on Thursdays, beginning April 11th, 2024, at 7.30 p.m., and we meet at American Patriot Coffee. Shout out to Councilman Brazel for his support and always providing a place for us to provide educational information to the community. Second point, Madam Chair, um, I won't be able to stay to get this answered and I know you can't answer the question, so I'm going to make the assumption that since Councilman Cato and Councilman Shoemake put this on the agenda regarding the adding two at-large membership positions for the Kershaw County Clean Community Commission, that I should just reach out to them if I would like to volunteer or apply for those positions because I don't see any paperwork on the wall to be able to put my information down. So I know you can't answer. I mean, I know, I wish you could blink once for yes, twice for no, but um, I'll just reach out to them <laughs> via um, email. And, and that'll be my assumption that I just need to reach out to them to find out more information. Yes, ma'am. And we look forward to seeing you at the Constitution is the Solution class. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Torres. All right, the next speaker is Lynn Canto. Uh, Tom, we have Tom Webb, Madam Chair. Um, so Mr. Webb is in Crescenda Torres's spot. The next person that signed up is Lynn Canto. Okay, Ms. Canto, please come to the podium. I already switched him on my sheet, so. How are you? My name is Lynn Canto. I live in Kershaw County, and I've lived here for 30 years, and I'm involved in the horse community. And I attended a planning meeting on Monday of last week, I think. I've been at so many meetings, I can't remember which one's which. Um, and during that planning meeting, they presented an overlay for the airport, which I thought was really interesting and a great idea. I like the airport. My brother used to take flying lessons as a kid. Woodward Field has two jets, 60 piston aircraft, and one helicopter, that's a total of 63 types of planes. I'm here to talk to you about the number of horses that are in Kershaw County and the impact it has on Kershaw County and the impact that the Camden Training Center has on Kershaw County. It's historic, one, as I've spoken to you before, but I want to explain to you that Kershaw County needs an equine overlay as much as the airport. Right now, at the, at the, as far as flat race horses, there are 25 to 70 through Donna Freyer's barn. Wootens have 28. Contos have eight. Kingsley Steeplechase has 23. Dalton has 18. Valentine has 12. Gomina has 12. Boucher has seven. Hendricks has seven. White has six. Gillum has had four. Cuddeth has, has four, Watts two, Elliot has one, Edwards has one, Ruck has one. That means between 158 to 203 horses just in training. Now, not all thoroughbreds are in training. You have the stallions that are for breeding. You have foals. You have yearlings that come in. But my reason for being here is Stuart Grant, and I, I don't know if we're allowed to mention names, so we'll say the developer of the Cayman Training Center, um, said there were no horses, and these are just race horses. I come from the background of show horses. I've done trails. I've done western. I showed for USC and Huntsey and Western. So I know how many horses are in Kershaw County. I know there are at least 1,500 thoroughbreds in some fashion or form. I know in my neighborhood right now, just my neighborhood, Trailwinds and Foxwood, there's 16 farms with 75 horses. At Red Fox Road, 20 farms with at least 100 horses. What I'm trying to say is if you develop, allow him to develop the training center, which is not you, but the community, there's no going back. It will change the image of Camden. And we compete with Tryon. We compete with Aiken. 
if they know that th this is allowed to happen, it changes the equine community for us. So why am I talking to you? Because the property, one of the properties, is still in the county. And I need you to understand the significance of this decision. I'm recommending an equine overlay for Camden and Kershaw County, no annexation of the Camden Training Center, and no housing development. That the facility should remain some type of equine-related activity connecting Springdale by Bridal Path. Camden needs to develop a horse district based on equine cultural promotion. An equine activities committee must be organized to address development. Equine act acti activities and education should be available through Central Carolina Campus and Agriculture at Willard's Technical Center. And a moratorium on subdivisions needs to be put in place because there's too much development going on. I'm all for developing, but at a reasonable pace. You see, I work in the schools, and Camden Elementary is, uh, Elementary is almost at capacity, which would force rezoning to Jackson and Pine Tree, which would force the district to have to purchase 25 acres to build and build a 35 to $40 million school. They can't afford to build another new school right now because they have to build a new school in the Elgin and Lugoff area, which would require a bond referendum. And the Lugoff and Elgin would have to have that first. So my point of being here is, to the powers that be, I encourage, I beg, that we not allow the Camden Training Center to be developed into 350 houses for now, as he says, to 800 houses later because we can't handle the traffic. We need further study for traffic, for schools, for public safety. I highly recommend this, and I bet there's quite a few people in the back here that agree with me. Ms. Canto, thank you. Thank your, you. Time. your time is Thank you, Ms. Canto. The next speaker is Ted Brunson. Hi, Ted. Be very short and quick, which I know would be a surprise to most people behind me. You can read the whole thing for five minutes if you want to. Well, I'm not an auctioneer, but anyway, um, I'm going to dovetail off of what Ms. Canto said um, and also let you know that I just left the city uh, meeting just a few minutes ago and uh, quite surprised but quite pleased. Uh, Jeffrey Graham has come forward and said that he would like to do some sort of joint uh, city and county uh, committee. Uh, to possibly pull two from you know various resources, uh, two from the equine industry, to look at studying you know the Camden Training Center, which has been the impetus of, of a lot of my efforts, but also knowing what we have out at Maverick Hills. Uh, I know that y'all had heard me talk about the impact fee that we had up in the Fort Mill area, that it brought a ton of money into the city and into the county. To, and I'll, I'll steal one from Mr. Roy. I think the only thing I ever agreed with him about when he said, you know, the been here's don't need to have to pay for the come here's. So the people that come here need to pay for their fair share. And so um, instituting a higher impact fee uh, would, would solve a lot of problems as far as, as the schools are. We'll lighten the tax load on all the other people uh, that are here right now. But I, I was very excited to, to hear that Jeffrey is, is going to reach out to y'all which is a very southern term, thank you, but uh, I was going to reach out to y'all and, and, and come forward with that. Uh, I, I think that's exactly what we've needed, and, and a lot of people, um, you know, that, that I've been in contact with are, are you know, really want to see that happen. I, and and I, for the life of me, I couldn't understand why it didn't. So anyway, I wanted to let y'all know that, and again, that hopefully he'll be reaching out to y'all real soon. Um, gee, and I don't have anything else to say, and I've got three minutes left. Consider yourself lucky. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunson. The next speaker is Tammy Livingston. Hi, Tammy. So the case that I was going to speak on has been withdrawn. However, I do want to encourage County Council to look at some traffic concerns. The Highway 1 issue has already been um, mentioned. However, on Watson Street, which is one of the roads that this property borders on, um, because I work from home and I see um, my office is there and I have a full view of Watson Street every day as I'm working, I see the foot traffic and the vehicle traffic. My concern is the safety of the walkers. We do not, we do not have sidewalks um, and the 
vehicular traffic has increased tremendously over the last few years. And because of the foot traffic, I'm very concerned about um, the safety of the walkers. We just had a death on White Pond Road because it, uh, an older lady tried to cross and was hit by a vehicle. We have foot traffic on Watson Street that includes families with children with no sidewalks. We also have military personnel who are carrying rucksacks. We call them ruckers. And they're trying to get in there, exercise with their rucksacks. And then we have individuals. Some of them are in high school and are walking to and from the store or they're getting off a bus. So I'm very concerned with foot traffic, additional development, and the impacts to safety in that area, regardless of how we further develop that area. I think some additional studies need to be done on the traffic and the safety in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Livingston. The next speaker is Charles Sazjad. You'll pass. Can you please tell me how to say your last name? Shaddy. Shaddy. Mr. Shaddy. I apologize for that. Okay. And now we are up to Tom Webb the third. Looks like to me. Um, if he could just uh, stop improving the sewer system or expanding the sewer system, it would have a great effect on the, uh, these um, housing developments and too many houses. But uh, how are you going to feed them if things go bad? Things could really go bad. They've been bad before. It's been a long time. People forget. But if we get into a war, uh, EMP, um, social unrest, and the food quits coming, how are you going to feed these people? We have been on, would have been on starvation diet before they came in. It's going to be really bad. But what I wanted to really speak about is the uh, flower pot law, your new litter ordinance. All of y'all on county council, I can count as friends. And all the people out in the great boondocks of Kershaw County, they are my kind of people, and I must look out for them. They live in the great expanses between Camden, Cassett, Bethune, Pisgah, Liberty Hill, the east and west side of the river and lake, down to Boykin and over to Elgin's and Lugoff's backwoods. In other words, out in the country. These people live out in the country. These are some of the dearest people in the world, and they only want to be let alone and not be regulated out of existence. Would... Some of them have marched off to war and never come back. Would they ever do it again? Perhaps not if American-style liberty is whittled down to nothing. The whittling is happening everywhere, even in Kershaw County. And that brings me to the flower pot law, your new litter ordinance. I know some of y'all don't like to read, but if you're going to lead, you have to read with a very critical eye for what's in an ordinance and what it really says and what its intentions are. So if you connect the dots in your new litter law, it explains it right there in its own words that uh, flower pots are outlawed. They're outlawed. You can't have a flower pot on your private property. You read the new litter ordinance carefully, you can see it outlaws crockery on private property way out in the boondocks. Crockery is an earthenware pot, a flower pot. Your new litter ordinance is, among other things, a flower pot law. So I'm turning mine in to avoid a $250 fine. I can't have this anymore. The old litter law signed by Governor McMaster was kind of uh, good to private property. Your new ordinance is not. You've all heard the, uh, the words... The punishment should fit the crime. McMaster's law does that. $25 for a lesser infraction, up to 1000 for a greater infraction. Your litter ordinance, $250 fine, fits all, breaks the Eighth Amendment in the Bill of Rights and is unconstitutional. <coughs> the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, it's not, it's not just something that is kind of the guidelines. It is the supreme law of the land. It is the supreme law of the land. So I'm turning in my flower pot. It's, uh, it is a taking, and the Fifth Amendment requires I be paid for it. But um, I like y'all, so I'm not going to require any payment from y'all. <laughs> I'll 
I'm just turning in my flower pot to you. This, this is now your flower pot to worry over how you're going to avoid $250 fine. I'm letting go of it. And that's the end of that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Webb. All right, this concludes public comments for this evening. Evening. Thank you to everyone that spoke and signed up and gave council input. All right, up to item number six, public presentations. We have one public presentation tonight. It is Mr. Dean Durham. Um, I am so happy to welcome him to the microphone. Um, my brother in arms, former deputy commandant of the drill sergeant school at Fort Jackson. Thank you for your service, Dean, and welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. It, it, let me, can I say one thing about yes, this Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> this man's out trying to help vets. He's going to get into that with Fish House and other issues, and he's the real deal. I tell you, he's just not talk. This man is action. Thank you so much for what you do for our thank vets you, and your you. service well, and your you. friendship. Cool. Thank you once again, Madam Chair. Uh, the Fisher House, we talk about because, because it can make a true... Mr. Durham, can you extend that microphone so it's sure a little closer? Can. There you go. Thank can you. you. Hear me now? All right, cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of, you know, the support when these folks are going through unforeseeable medical conditions and they need to stay within the Fisher House. What is the Fisher House? The Fisher House is basically similar to a Ronald McDonald House. We refer to it as a Ronald McDonald House on steroids, right? And what it does is, is it provides at no cost to the families during these trying times, right? Uh, free of charge, because we know that there's different type of organizations that have been out there taking advantage of those loved ones during these trying times, and that's just not okay for those that have made the true and ultimate sacrifice for this great nation. Zach and Elizabeth Fisher identified the needs back in the 1990s. Right now, we are at 71 Fisher houses. The latest, we have two in the state of South Carolina, one in Charleston and the latest one here in Columbia, South Carolina. It is located on the campus of Dorn VA. This Fisher House is unique because it's both a private and a public relationship with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And we would like to also extend out an invitation to the council board where we can get you all to tour over there um, so that you can truly see how these donations, taxpayer dollars were not a part of this, but donations. We fell a little bit short on our capital campaign, but nevertheless, the Fisher Foundation saw the need, particularly since we have Fort Jackson, one of the largest training installations in the world here. It's also designed for those active duty service members that get injured in training, unforeseeable illnesses, and their loved ones and they need to come in and support them. The Fisher House itself is 15,000 square feet. We got 16 beautiful suites there. Once again, this is at no cost to the family to include the mills. We have outdoor patio, living rooms, libraries. The Fisher House overall is a cost savings to family members that are gonna be occupying for the mere fact that you don't have to pay the fees out there in the civilian sector. We did some calculations. We know it's right between $800,000 and $1 million cost savings a year. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, city council, Madam Chair, we now have that Fisher House here in Columbia, South Carolina. How can you all help? Spread the word right, to veterans. Families that are in need. One of the criteria is you have to be outside a 50 mile radius from the dorm VA. The other way is donations. But most importantly, we have a food train. It's a meal calendar. Have your organization sign up. Let's really make sure that we wrap our arms around those that are in needs. That are in need because once again, there will be a time when we will be in need. Thank you Mary, very much, Madam Chair, Jimmy, City Council members. Thank you, Mr. Durham. All right, yeah. Um, Thank you so much, but don't go anywhere. It might be with some uh, questions. Yes, yes. Sure. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Yes, this is near and dear to my heart and all of council. I think I can speak for each of them. Can you tell me just briefly the process? So a veteran will be being, they're treated at Dorn VA for, and is it an extended period of time? Yeah, so, so, so what happens, Madam Chair, say, hypothetically speaking, we get a veteran over there that needs, uh, that's coming out of the Anderson or Rock Hill area, 
and these type of surgical procedures going to require that veteran to stay in that Fisher house or to stay somewhere, right? Um, not the veteran itself. The veteran be admitted into a medical facility, right? Uh, while they get treatment, and at the same time, we want to have their loved ones in close proximity to them. So okay. normally, the social social workers get involved to make sure that they fit the criteria to actually be granted permission to stay within the Fisher House. Okay. And so their loved ones will move into the Fisher House while they're undergoing their surgery or procedure yes, until ma'am. they're done. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the meal train, a meal calendar, that is to feed the families while feed they're the there. Family. Yes, okay. Ma'am. And that's something Kershaw County citizens can sign up for and oh, get we, involved in. We would in. love okay. it, ma'am. We would love it. Awesome. Gentlemen? Any questions, comments? I'd like to make a comment. I think it's a wonderful, um, wonderful facility and a wonderful uh, vision for what, what you're doing for veterans. Um, so many are forgotten and, and, and looked over, and um, they, they fight a battle that, that civilians don't fight. They bring things home with them, and we know that it's physical and mental. This is a... a very well put together. I had no idea that there were the, this many of these. You said it was 71 in the state. 71 worldwide, and we have one in Germany as well, but we got a total of 71, and the Fisher Foundation has identified their next three locations. Well, I, I'm sure we have information on this here in the county office. Is that right? Do we have information on the Fisher House here in, in our Department we, of Veterans we, Affairs? We got it. We, get, we, we have it now. Good. I'd like to make sure that we have it available for everyone locally and um, anyone that might need the service and anyone that might be interested in donating to the cause. Thank you for presenting. Very thank, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you, much, Mr. Brazel. Yeah. Well, yeah. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Tucker. Well, thank you. I, I don't know if Mr. Norman can hear me or not. Mr. Durham. Yes, he can hear you. Um, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Dean. I don't know why I said Mr. Norman, Mr. Dean. I uh, just want to say thanks again for the presentation, and sorry I um, wasn't able to get up with him earlier before today. Uh, my question for him, though, is what's the uh, extended stay? Like, um, say you have a loved one that's a veteran and you're from out of town, the 50-mile radius. Um, what's the max can they stay? <laughs> while they're being uh while the loved one is being treated mr durham he can't hear you unless you're in the microphone yeah so right now we're looking at it's a three-week process but what's good is social workers will be the ultimate deciding factor uh, based off their uh, communication with the physicians is there a maximum okay. no no ma'am okay no, no max mr tucker no, it depends on the social worker and the physician yes. and the treatment okay I just wanted to clear that up. Okay. Thanks again, and I appreciate this presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mr. Durham, do you, are you all working on any future houses in South Carolina? Uh, no, ma'am, not at You keep walking away from the mic. You might just want to stay there. <laughs> no, you. ma'am, not at this time. <laughs> um, and you and I had spoke about uh, the Dorn VA Employee Appreciation Day. Can you remind us all when that is? Yeah, let me, that's going to be. Sorry to put May, you on the spot. You put me on the spot, ma'am. No problem. I love it. Um, I think it's May 17th at the Dorn VA. And what we'd like to do, ma'am, is uh, we like to tell those that are providing services and care to the, our veterans that have served, we want to tell them thank you. And it's okay and you know, to tell people th- thank you and that we truly appreciate the sacrifice that they made as well because sometimes it can be quite trying. And in saying that, we have identified our Employee Appreciation Day at Dorn VA on the 17th of May. 17th of May. Okay. So that's another way we can get involved here in Kershaw County and show our appreciation to everyone working with the veterans. Are there Dorn VA employees working at the Fisher House? Or is uh, it completely full, private? We have, one, one, we have two. One full-time uh, house manager, Candace uh, Cantler, and then we have one assistant manager. Yes, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I love the private-public partnership there, too. Mm-hmm. So... It's okay, awesome. I don't have any more questions, this, I promise. This, this Anybody man, else? This man lives, eats, and breathes this mission. And yes. That's what's so good about it. You know, uh, what were you, how many years did you serve? Uh, 28 years. We've got a Vietnam veteran right behind you watching. Mm-hmm. Here, mm-hmm. Sir, but we thank, and I, I was drafted doing that war. I didn't go to war. I was a clerk typist. 
I got I had to go learn how to type 21 words on a typewriter, but I did my <laughs> I did my service, and I was so proud that I was able to serve, and uh, I'm, I'm so proud when I see our Vietnam vets, especially, come in here with uh, their hats on, and thank you so much again, Dean. And I'll be in touch, and I, I want to help in any way I can personally as well. I look forward to it, and thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Durham, and thank you for your service. If we can give him another round of applause for being here tonight. All right, item number seven, approval of minutes. So we have three to approve tonight. We'll start with the first one, our retreat from Thursday, February 1st. These minutes are a little delayed. There were some additions and some corrections that needed to happen. So thank you, Ms. Parler, as always, for getting these ready for us. Is there a motion pertaining to the Thursday, February 1st? This is the first day of the special called meeting for budget retreat. Madam Chair, I will be refraining from this since I was absent. Okay. All right. Motion to approve these minutes. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the Thursday, February 1st budget retreat special called meeting. Is there a second? A second. Okay, second by Mr. Brazel. And Mr. Tucker, are you trying to come through? I was, but uh, you got it, then Brazel got it. Okay. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the Thursday, February 1st budget retreat special called meeting minutes indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? Oh, Mr. Tucker, you were yes. absent. Well, Thursday, February 1st? Well, I'm sustained if I'm absent. Okay. Yes, I was the first day, yes. Yeah. First All right, in sustains Mr. Tomlinson and Mr. Tucker. All right, we'll get those on the website and filed. Next is Saturday, February 3rd. Um, this was the mm -hmm. second day of the special call meeting budget wor workshop retreat. Madam Chair, I will be abstaining again. Okay. All right, motion to approve these minutes. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion we approve the minutes of February 3rd. Okay, Mr. Cato with the motion, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Brazel. Any comments, concerns, or amendments? Okay, and uh, Mr. Jones, you are also absent on February 3rd. I was gonna say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> At the appropriate time. Okay. All right, all those <laughs> in favor of approving the February 3rd minute meetings indicate by raising your hand, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, Mr. Tucker. And let the record show that I abstain. I vote yes. Okay. And with Mr. Jones and Mr. Tomlinson abstaining. All right. We'll get those filed and on the website. Next, our, la our first meeting in March, Tuesday, March 12th, regularly scheduled county council meeting. Is there a motion at this time? Madam Chair, make a motion we approve March 12th meeting minutes. Okay. Mr. Tomlinson with the motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second. Uh, Mr. Tucker. All right, any updates, amendments, or changes, concerns with these minutes? Okay, all those in favor of approving the Tuesday, March 12th meeting minutes indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? Vote oh, yes, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, up to item number eight, ordinances. First ordinance this evening is a first reading of an ordinance of the Kershaw County Council to amend the membership provisions for the Kershaw County Clean Community Commission by adding two at-large membership positions. This was placed on the agenda by Councilman Cato and Councilman Shoemake. Is there a motion pertaining to this ordinance? Madam Chair, I make a motion we uh, approve this or adopt this uh, ordinance to add two members to the Clean Commission. Okay, I'll Mr. Second. Cato with the motion and Mr. Tomlinson with the, Mr. Tomlinson with the second. Uh, Mr. Cato, you have the floor for discussion. So after some discussion with Chairwoman Wolf, who, who chairs the Clean Commission, um, it, it came to our attention that Bethune Town, the town of Bethune, uh, did not have a representative on the Clean Commission. 
Um, so as it stands now, they were supposed to be, um, each district had a uh, representative and in each um, municipality in the county had a representative. Um, somehow or another, over time, that has, has got out of sorts and Bethune is lacking one of their representatives. So after speaking with, with the chairwoman and, and others, um, it's, it's my recommendation that we up the um, commission to 11. Um, the clean commission can always use extra help. We have people that are willing to serve, as, as you heard tonight. I know Bethune has a, a person in mind for their representative, and she's willing to serve. So I think it would be a great help to the clean commission if we add these two, two members. And uh, this is one of those commissions that can always use extra help without causing any extra issues, if that makes any sense. So that's, that's my recommendation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Mr. Tomlinson, anything um, to add? I would just like to piggyback off of what Mr. Cato said. Um, the Clean Commission does outstanding work across the county. Um, everybody could always use a little bit of extra hand, especially when you're picking up all the trash that we like to talk about on the side of the roads. Uh, in Kershaw County, um, appreciate all they do. So just to clarify, all this is doing is adding two at-large positions. We currently have nine, correct, Mr. DeBose? Um, we currently have nine. This is adding two more, so we will have 11 positions on the Clean Commission. Um, if you would like to volunteer for that, you can go on the app online and get an application, fill out the application online, which will be submitted to Ms. Hannah, and then put on a thing. So um, we'd love to have volunteers, um, and I'm assuming after we get through third reading, it'll be coming up. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Tomlinson. Anything else? Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Tucker. I just want to uh, remind my colleagues to be cognizant of um, I missed support for the two additional uh, at-large members, but uh, we want to make sure that we cover as much territory as possible in the future on replacing board members because we don't want the board to get too big because then it becomes a matter of being able to be functional and uh, have a quorum and all that good stuff. So just FYI. Right. Um, thank you, Mr. Tucker. So yes, I'm absolutely in support. Thank you for doing this. This will have each of the municipalities involvement in it. Um, the only thing that I wanna do with you, Mr. Cato, um, for second reading, in section 2444, it says the six members will be nominated by each council member per single member district, and then two members shall be at large by any nominated council member. I would like the chair to be included in that single member as part of the six, so actually change it to seven, just to give whoever's in the chair an opportunity to nominate someone by, from their seat as well. The only, the only thing, problem that I see with that um, is that if you ha once you have, you have three, see, let me make sure I got my math right. So if you have six, and then you have three municipalities would be nine, and then that adds you two at large. So each once you have six members, six districts, then you would have three municipalities that would give you. Um, it, it would it would it would take up three more seats, and then you would have two at large seats. So the two at large seats could be nominated by anyone, including the chair. Well, I think the chair right, should. I think the chair should get one of that large because. Well, yeah, that's all should, I'm saying. The chair should be able to. Each member that. of county council gets a nomination, and then there's just one at large by uh, anybody. I, just I don't have a split it with that. seven and one instead of six and two, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to support it. It's just maybe something we can work on okay. or just change for a second it. reading. Just put it in there. It's, it's the right Madam, thing to do. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Tucker. So if I follow you correct, you, you just saying appoint one of those at-large seats to the chair. Yes. Person, that means yes, yes. just move one future. of those. Right. Where you, where you have. I think that's fair enough. I think that's yeah. fair. The that's chairwoman fair. has an appointment like we all do. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're still in discussion we want to about make it. That amendment now? Yeah. Um, would you? I mean, I'm happy to make a motion okay. to amend. You. I'll make a motion to amend. Okay. I'll make a motion to amend 
that we add one of those positions are given is given to the chairperson of the county council, um, just as each single member each district has a representative. So does the chairperson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cato. So amendment and second by Mr. Tomlinson. Um, section two dash four four four. Mr. Debose, you can help me, but we would change that six to seven and that two to a one. Correct. Okay. okay. Okay, any discussion on that change? It was just an oversight. Let's, we need to vote and go on. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, striking six to seven, striking two to make it a one, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote on the amendment? I this? vote yes on the amendment. Okay. Manager. Yes to the amendment. And back to the motion on first reading. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of this first reading of these ordinance of this ordinance as amended indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That passes first reading. Thank you, gentlemen. Next case, third reading for case 24-05. I will make a motion that we approve third reading of case 2405. Okay, motion to approve by Mr. Tomlinson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Tucker. Uh, and this is Kershaw County Planning and Zoning Commission request for text amendment by Kershaw County in ordinance to amend the Kershaw County South Carolina Unified Code of Zoning and Land Development Regulations, section 31.3, table 3-4, to provide greater clarity to the develop, to the distinction in maximum allowed residential dwelling densities between single family residential development and multifamily apartment development. The public hearing was March 12th and this will be the third and final reading. <clears throat> Any discussion? I just like to yes. okay. just say thank oh, I'm sorry, to say thank you to the planning commission and, and, and chair chairwoman Fiona Martin she's doing a fantastic job. She is. She's phenomenal. Well, they and all are. They all are. But. And all this is doing is just clarifying, um, just to clean up the existing ordinance. No real changes to it. Yes. And Mr. Shoemake's not here, but want to thank him for his work on this. So all those in favor of the third reading of case 24-5, updating section 31.3, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I vote yes, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, Mr. Tucker is yay. All right, Charlie, first reading, case 24-06, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of Kershaw County to rezone approximately 4.9 acres of property TMS 348-00-00120 and 085, owned by Joe and Cindy Smith and located on the north side of Mill Creek Trace with addresses of 116 and 120 Mill Creek Trace, Elgin, South Carolina, from R15 Low Density Residential District to RD2 Rural Resource District. Is there a motion on this ordinance? I'll make a motion. Okay, Mr. Brazel, motion to adopt? Yes. I'll okay. second. Okay, second by Mr. Tomlinson and into discussion. Uh, Mr. Brazel, if it's okay to yield to Mr. DeBose so he can give us yes, of course. Yeah, I'd like to um, an update it. on this. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Apologies, I need to flip to my map in here. So, Madam Chair, um, this uh, rezoning proposal uh, was forwarded to you by the Planning Commission with a unanimous appro approval. Um, there are two parcels totaling 4.9 acres. Um, one of the parcels is vacant. The other is op occupied by the um, applicant. The thrust of this amendment is that the applicant would like to place a double-wide manufactured home on the address for one of the son um, their sons. Um, uh, of course, conditional zoning is not allowed in South Carolina, so y'all would need to consider all of the potential allowed uses within that RD2 district. Um, 
Curiously, directly across the road, the zoning districts will allow for a double wide manufactured home. And in the vicinity of this property, there are several uh, mobile homes on other um, properties that uh, either pre existed the prohibition on double wides or are um, single wide um, themselves. One of the concerns at the Planning Commission was whether the applicant would be able to <laughs> further develop this property or subdivide it, um, perhaps even um, uh, institute like a mobile home type park. Uh, none of those possibilities exist due to the limited road frontage of the property. Um, and that appeared to satisfy the uh, citizens that came to speak at um, the public hearing in front of uh, Planning Commission. Um, Ms. Martin, the chair, just remarked that, um, you know, a double wide is not dissimilar from a single wide mobile home. And the fact that there's this uh, geographic dividing line of the road where one use is allowed and one is not. Um, to her spoke that uh, the new comp plan and new ZLDR might need to uh, consider more overlap and allowed uses among districts. Um, in any event, uh, that's kind of the high level summary. If y'all have any further questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brazel? Uh, no further questions about the use of the property. Um, but, are there different underpinning requirements? This may be a little bit out in left field for a double wide versus a single wide, or are they pretty similar? I'd have to let uh, Mr. Adams Ruskowski, uh, the uh, planning director, speak to that. I, Mr. Templer, can we have planning and zoning director yes. approach the podium? Okay. Can I say something while he's coming up? Just um, one. Mr. Brazel has the floor if, yeah. it, if he yields. One second. Go ahead, Jimmy. Thank you, sir. I, I'd just like to say I think this is a great thing. You know, this is. This is the kind of stuff we want to see is when we work with the citizens and their properties and to see that the planning commission is, you, you know, is doing that and is coming to us in a positive way. So I just want to say I appreciate that. I'd, I'd be happy to address your question. Uh, yes, double wides must be either uh, brick curtain wall or a type of like hardy plank, uh, cement, fiber type siding. And you can do a vinyl siding on a single wide? Yes. Any specific reason why that is? I had a, um, I had, had a fellow ask me the reason why. And while we're on the subject, I just thought I'd ask you why. Why for vinyl? Yeah, why the, why the, why the difference for a double wide versus a single wide? Why well, the... uh, we see a lot more double wides actually become real property. Uh, they retire the title. Whereas single wide mobile homes tend to be more literally mobile. Uh, they, they move from park to park or from rented lot to rented lot. So the, the, the actual use of a single wide versus a double wide is, is certainly different. Well, and so the vinyl, you know, the vinyl skirting allows that in a single wide to be um, you know, less, less cost prohibitive to be able to move it. Is that typical for double wides to to have that the, the more expensive underpinning and brick and hardy plank? Is that typical in other counties, or is, is that something just specific to Kershaw County? No, you see that quite often because again, uh, double wide manufactured homes in South Carolina can be retired. The title can be retired, and it can be taxed just like a site built home. Single wides cannot. Correct. Okay, Mr. Brazel. Thank you. Yes, sir. This was some years back before I was on county council, I think that this was enacted by the previous council, and I never agreed with it. Because, well, I, I, mean, I mean, I just don't. I didn't then. That was 20 years ago, and I don't now. It, but it, but it is pretty, the law. It adds a pretty substantial cost. And, I, yes, I sir. And I appreciate your comments on it, Mr. Brazel. And that's something we will look at in the rewrite, okay. too, if, if that's council's wish. And stay right there, Mr. Tucker. Yes, ma'am. It was done some years ago, and the purpose behind it is because we didn't want to become a mobile home park. There was a lot of mobile homes being moved in single wide at that time, and of course, you know the double wides and the marginal homes and stuff have more value. So it was um, we we wanted to dress them up to give them more value, and we wanted to deter as many single wides at that time as we possibly could. 
Um, so that's why those uh, ordinance were in place. I don't agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Okay. All right. Any questions for Planning and Zoning Director or Mr. DeBose? Thank you, Joy. Um, I absolutely have explanation. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, no problem allowing this rezone. Is the property owner here tonight? Can you approach the podium, please? Um, and I just want to confirm, you all rezoned another portion of your property already to do the same thing, correct? We did. Okay. Um, we have a son that we already rezoned for. Okay. He's beside us already, and then this one will be beside us. Okay. And thank you for being here tonight. Um, any questions for the property owner from council? Uh, Phoebe, have a right to do it. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, um, sorry it takes so long to get this done. It, it's, it takes a little bit too okay. long, really, okay. to, to have, okay. have it done, but thanks for your patience. All right. Thank you. And I'll just ask, council, as we do our rewrite, let's take this into consideration. Um, it, it does seem a little silly to me that right across the street, um, those homeowners can do this, and um, these owners have to apply for rezoning to do the exact same thing. So. Hey. Madam Chair. Yes, I, Mr. DeBose. That was a slight misstatement earlier. I do apologize. Um, it's not a permitted use here. The matter I was thinking of, and again, I apologize because there are two matters. 2408? Correct. Okay. That's the one with the property across the street that would allow it. Uh, okay. Thank you for the clarification. I, I still think they should be allowed to do it. So um, all those in favor of this first reading of case 2406, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Brazel, myself, Mr. Cato, Mr. Tomlinson, and Mr. Jones. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I vote yes. Okay, Mr. Tucker votes yes. And that will be on the next agenda for second reading. Thank you for being here, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Next case is Echo. First reading of case 2408. very similar situation. So this will be a rezoning request of 6.3 acres of property owned by Andrew Collins located on the west side of Smyrna Road with an address of 1147 Smyrna Road, Elgin, South Carolina from MRD1 Rural Resource District to RD2 Rural Resource District. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Bowes, for the same reason yes. to build. Yes, ma'am. For okay. People wide home, uh, not allowed in the current zoning district. Um, okay. Double wide here only allows for double wide across the street. Um, allows for both. Is my understanding. Okay. Is there a motion to approve this first reading on case twenty four zero eight? I'll make a motion to. Okay, Mr. Brazel, with the reading. motion, and is there a second? I'll second. Okay, second by Mr. Cato, and into discussion, Mr. Brazel, you have the floor. Uh, I'll yield to Mr. DeBose. I just want to make sure that we're clear on the facts of the case, and then we can vote. Okay, Mr. DeBose, if you'll give right. us the update on this one. Yeah, um, basically, I'll recycle my prior um, discussion for the prior case since I conflated the two. Similar issue, though. Um, Again, current zoning will not allow the manufactured house that the applicant wants to place on the property. Um, this one point, in fact, is the uh, rezoning matter where directly across the street it is allowed in that okay. entire district. Thank you. Um, so, again, that same same discussion point applies. Um, this would just allow the use of that um, single wide. Again, there is not sufficient frontage on this property for any further development or subdivision. Okay, thank you. And is the property owner here, Mr. Andrew Collins? Okay. All right, council, any questions or comments? Mr. Tucker? No, ma'am, I'm good, thank you. Okay. All right, all those in favor of this first reading of case 24-08, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Brazel, myself, Mr. Cato, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Jones. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I vote yes. Okay, Mr. Tucker is yay. And we'll see that on the next agenda for second reading. Okay, eight Foxtrot. First reading, case 2410. 
an ordinance to amend the Kershaw County Unified Code of Zoning and Land Development Regulations to remove Table 5-10 and amend Chapter 5, Section 3.8-3 and Chapter 5, Section 3.8-6 to update and clarify road design standards by reference and an incorporation of design criteria and standards of the South Carolina Asphalt Pavement Association, also known as SCAPA. Is there a motion at this time for this ordinance? Madam Chair, I make a motion we approve the first reading of ordinance. Okay. Mr. Tomlin makes a motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay, I'll second. Second. All right. I beat you, Mr. Tucker. All right. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, can we get um, attorney to give yes. us a brief? Mr. DeBose, we're yielding to you. Can you give us um, an update on this? And you have some design standards that Mr. Templer passed out at the very beginning of the meeting also. Those go with this ordinance. Correct. Um, Madam Chair, members of the council, uh, there are um, road design standards contained within the ZLDR um, set forth as both general design criteria and as a design thickness um, chart. Um, it has come to the um, county staff's attention that the chart thicknesses um, have proven insufficient in many regards in satisfying the general design um, requirement and criteria that roads in Kershaw County have a 20-year lifespan. Um, the uh, presumed policy intent behind that um, was so that uh, maintenance activities on publicly dedicated roads would not occur prematurely and that taxpayers wouldn't be um, saddled with the burden of repairing a prematurely fail failing road so a 20-year useful life was um, landed on. Again, the uh, pavement thicknesses required in the chart um, uh, have been determined to be outdated and not as robust as those uh, that would be required to satisfy a 20-year life design. Uh, this text amendment seeks to um, clarify the ordinance by removing the table and referencing the SCAPA design standards and pavement thicknesses. My understanding is SCAPA bases those um, design thicknesses on various soil types and um, site conditions that may be present, um, kind of in broad buckets of categories. Um, but that is essentially uh, what is occurring here. SCDOT was cons consulted, that is South Carolina Department of Transportation, because the general design criteria says to SCDOT specs and a 20-year life. SCDOT was consulted um, some years ago to determine what a acceptable pavement section would be to yield a 20-year life based on their experience of road building in Kershaw County. And um, they had suggested a 3.5 inch pavement thickness that was based on their rural local classification roads with an average daily traffic count of under a thousand vehicles. That's applicable to um, all but, you know, the most gargantuan planned unit development type subdivision. So it would be applicable to broadly to um, almost all development work and any PDD work, of course, would be before you all for approval and could have additional um, standards attached to it. There is a um, representative from SCAPA here to um, speak to the technical requirements and how they develop their criteria. Um, just by uh, way of broader background, incorporation of a design criteria from a professional organization um, will also assure that the county's um, design standards stay up to date as uh, technologies evolve, mm -hmm. material sciences evolve, um, but again, the um, SCAPA representative um, is certainly available and um, has come to speak to those matters and perhaps give you all some background on the um, SCAPA process and how they come to their okay. criteria. Awesome. Um, would the SCAPA representative please approach the podium? Could I start with one thing? Yes, absolutely. I don't, I don't support this. It's just more bureaucracy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And Sir, that, what's your name? My name's Cliff Selkinghouse. Cliff? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. No um, my first question is how often does SCAPA update their requirements? So you're at 3.5 right now. Right. Can we expect that to jump to four in the next year or? 
there's no plans to, to increase that number. Th these are based on uh, ni ASHTO 93 and 98 standards, which is basically what the DOT uses okay. for their payment design programs. Um, I, I retired from the DOT. I was working with them for 28 and a half years in the construction materials division. And uh, now I work for, the, obviously, the Asphalt Payment Association as their technical director. And uh, that manual was uh, developed by Clemson University. Um, and it basically took the consideration of the 93-98 that uh, designed the program and kind of make it a little simpler for the, the counties and, and cities to use um, as a payment design program. Okay. Do you know if there are any other counties that use your information as their standard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, right now, I can just say right off the cuff that Lexington and Richland uh, have adopted those. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mr. DeBose, do you know of any other counties that are going by this standard instead of SCDOT? So... Um, to that point, I know that um, Lancaster County, while I, d I do not believe they utilize SE DOT standards, they have typical cross sections, and I believe their um, pavement thickness requirement for their le least intensive road is three and a half inches. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. If what was, um, did y'all work with some of our contract? By the way, thank you for being here. Yes, sir. Did you uh, did y'all work with some of our contracted engineers earlier? In Kershaw County. Yes, sir. Uh, um, Mr. Hogue. He's and the he's, one that brought me here today. And yes, he, he's with who? He's with Kershaw. Oh, Kershaw Hogue? County. Yes, sir. You tell me. Jonathan. Oh, okay. okay. Where's Jonathan at? Just oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he's with road and, dra and drainage. Yes, sir. So y'all never did have any conversation or contact with... Uh, a contracted engineer that we've had in the past? Uh, no, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any other questions for the SCAPA representative? Yes, Mr. Basel. So wh wh where are we at now? What's, what's the standard that we've been adhering to? What, what's the thickness? The standard that is typically used as referenced in, I think, in that early uh, memo that was uh, dated February 21st of this year uh, is uh, six, six inches of, uh, of granular aggregate base and two inches of asphalt. So you're increasing your thickness by an inch and a half. So by doing that, you increase your, your, your lifespan of your payments. That six and two was basically set up on a 10-year design life. And uh, the new proposed uh, guidelines are based on a 20-year, as mentioned earlier. Um, by uh, Mr. DeBose. So, so basically what you're doing is increasing your, your lifespan of your pavement and, re and reducing your, your future maintenance costs on your taxpayers. Right, so does this, does this apply to parking lots? No, sir. This is strictly used for uh, residential neighborhoods with, with a high percentage of vehicles, just your consumer vehicles, and uh, your school buses and your trash trucks. Not anything higher than, as far as volume uh, was considered in that payment design. So this is for residential neighborhoods. How, how does it apply to, um, say, if, uh, I don't know, we've already got Even a lease, but, but a Home Depot comes in mm. and they, they built a big parking lot, right? And yes. What is their standard? In that case, you're going you're gonna to jump significantly higher classes because you're having to deal with a lot heavier traffic as far as your truck traffic and your heavy loading that's considered in the payment design. So you're, you're dealing with the tractor trailers. So you're going from a class three to a class four. Um, similar, I would say, not quite to the interstate section, but you have a lot of standing traffic, which requires um, a lot more aggregate to be put into the mix, and obviously the pavement thickness has to be increased to uh, withstand those heavy loads. And that's in here as well? Yes, sir. That's in, the, that's in there. Going down in that, in that handout that was given to you, the um, one that says poor subgrade at the very bottom. Looks like right. this, Mr. Basel. It gives the different classes. Yeah, they weren't. I'm, yeah, I think it's 1-13 one, one at the very bottom of the page. Section 1-13, and you see in your class, like class four, this is when you're talking about, you're, in this particular case in that, if you were to put down a class four payment, you'd be a way over designing your payment. So in other words, that would significantly increase your, your cost of your, of your uh, road by doing that. Yeah, so in a class four, you only have a two inch asphalt layer, is that That's right? correct, but you also have two, in, if you look in your middle section, you have two inch, over two inches again which we're proposing, you know, an inch and a half on top and a two-inch intermediate, but you have three more additional inches of asphalt aggregate base, which is, that total, is, that total obviously, in the middle right there is uh, seven inches total. So you're, you're effectively doubling the, the, the thickness of your pavement, so significantly increasing the cost of your, of your end product. 
and in that particular case, which is way extreme. What you're looking at is under 1,000 cars per day is the uh, pavement design on the second and third pages that you were given, which covers more than is adequate for your uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Tomlinson and then Mr. Tucker, if Mr. Basel is done. So I, I, I'm not quite done. I'm sorry. You're fine. Um, no, you're fine. And the reason why, I'm not a civil engineer, so I don't understand these things um, as well as you do. But <clears throat> if, if I were to vote on it, I would, I would need to understand it a little more. Right. Um, you have a traffic class one mm -hmm. with two inch and a half layers for a total of three. Is that not sufficient for a residential neighborhood? That that's a, yeah, that's something that would be recommended for a, a a church parking lot where you're talking about cars on Wednesdays and Sundays only, for the most part. So you're just talking about you know very very few, zero trucks, just just a few cars per day. In those particular cases, so that's the reason the pavement's thinner in those particular cases because your traffic traffic expected traffic levels are extremely small. Right. So bare but, bare minimal. We, if we're going from two inches to to three three and a half, I, I think three would probably be sufficient. Just looking at the cost of petroleum and the cost mm -hmm. of what it what it takes to do this, we keep adding cost to the cost of a home. So everybody likes to talk about um, affordable housing, and this, while on one hand, right, gives us a better long term road. Um, we're also adding cost to homes, aren't we? That's right. That's correct. And that would be obviously passed, you know, onto the builder to the to the new home buyer, but uh, you, that is basically extends that maintenance cycle for you guys in the county. So your your current taxpayers won't have to absorb that cost. Yeah, I see both sides. Um, I'd like to see us look at the the traffic class one. I think if we're going if we're going from two inches to three inches, that sounds like a, a pretty large jump in durability. Would that be satisfactory? Is that you're doubling your ex your life, your design, design life from a ten to a twenty year. So that adding an inch, basically, what you're doing now is substandard as far as our designs, where it's written right now with this the six and the two only being a two year, design, basically a, a two year uh, surface layer. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a two inch surface layer. Um, so you're you're increasing your 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 um, your upfront cost, but as far as long term, you're gonna you know, decrease your maintenance cycle. And that's one of the issues that, you know, with my experience with the DOT, that we've run into that situation where approximately 45 to 50% of our pavements in South Carolina are considered poor as far as the condition surveys. And that's because of that two and six situation where they were under-designed the pavements long-term because of the growth in their particular areas is going on throughout the state. But uh, basically, that's in turn turned into a future nightmare for the DOT to have to maintain those those payments. So those payments have, have turned into reconstruction candidates, where we have to do a re major reconstruction on those payments because there there's so many of them in our state. Forty five to fifty percent of our payments, and as far as the DOT, we have forty two thousand miles, which is a huge number. But as far as the upkeep and having to maintain that, that number of lane miles. Um, that that's the situation that the DOT is in right now because we're having to rebuild those roads because we did not increase those standards like they should have. And I think another <clears throat> another fair point would be that the different soil types that, that roads are built on would come into play. That's correct. Is the, how well the contractor does stumping and clearing and packing and getting the aggregate base ready before pouring the asphalt. So it's a lot at play here. Absolutely. I and think I'd, I'd like to have a little more time before voting on this. I just got this handout when I walked in to, okay. tonight, and this is a relatively serious topic. Absolutely. It's a relatively costly topic for a lot of folks. And like I said, if you look at page the, the second and third pages that were given to you, the, uh, the, I, I would look at the uh, one that says uh, three inches of surface and versus the three, the, basically the two, the one and a half plus two, which equals three. Um, you see your design life there. This is good data from, from our software, which is Pave Express, which you see at the very top that references the AASHTO design manual. And you see the, the design life, 10 years, 75% reliability. That is a good standard to uh, set your, uh, your payments program up on. 
okay? Using a two and a six that you're currently doing, it's gonna give you a reliability of less than 50%. So you, you're really taking it, you're setting yourself up to a lot of risk by using two inch and six inch. Using one and a half and, and two one and a half inch layers or a, a one and a half and two inch layer gives you a lot of serviceability, extended pavement life, Adam smoothness, two. et cetera. Um, Mr. Basel, may I interject? Yes. Um, Cliff, I'm going to yes, get you off the hot spot. Mr. Templer, did you put this on the agenda for us? Uh, yes, that's what okay. staffs. Um, so I want to hear from you yeah. and why this is on our agenda and why you're asking us to um, apply these. Because he didn't put it on the agenda. He's sure, right, here right, as an right. expert. Okay. Sure. And I appreciate Mr. Um, Buckinghouse being here. Um, this has been a pinch point for us operationally since I've been in my previous positions over the last eight years. We have um, had a lot of subpar and inferior paving jobs done um, that someone else's shortcut became the county's problem. Okay. So uh, we, we looked at um, what if a soil engineer was involved or, you know, would there be different types of soil compositions throughout the county? Um, but this is just, regardless of where you're at in the county, this, this, uh, this thickness is sufficient. Um, we have roads that are, uh, I think two projects, three projects, if I'm not mistaken, I won't name, but they are, we have had to sit down and have extended warranties put on these roads that were just freshly paved. They're cracking from curb to curb. They went out and sealed them. It was kind of, hey, let's wait and see what's going to go on here. I, was, I received pictures today of these roads, and those sealed cracks have cracked again, and that they've even expanded. So I just... Okay. Uh, also, if you look at the amount of development we have in Kershaw County, our paved road inventory is growing significantly, and it's growing at, at a... A rate that if if we put in three or four or five subdivisions within a year or two of one another if if we're going with a, a subpar road arguably they're all going to fail at the same time and we've been warned about this from the CTC that's our funding mechanism okay. for paving so um, and that was probably about five years ago they warned us about our paved um, inventory um, just from a just from an upkeep uh, standpoint so this is something that um, I, as the administrator, I, I, I need. Okay. I need this durability um, in it because we have a very limited public works division. We don't pave. We patch. Um, patching is just not going to be a long-term fix. Um, so I, I, I just think um, with all the other issues we have, we being um, operationally public, public works, you know, stormwater aside, um, we just need a durable product. And, okay. I, and I think this is, um, <clears throat> it is an increased cost to the developer. I understand that. I'm sensitive to that. But um, at the end of the day, I just don't think that um, it's, it's the taxpayer's obligation to ensure the profitability of, of our builders here. And that's just where I stand okay. on that. Thank you for that. So currently our ordinance does state a 20 year roadway life design is required in Kershaw County. So we have a table that gives us different thickness based on different soils that we're using. And so this table is not lasting 20 years. So we're saying two different things in our ordinance. Correct. And this okay. will, this cleans that up and it makes us consistent. Removing the table, going to 3.5 across the county we can ensure 20 years out of our roads. And yep. Okay. Current, Madam Chair, if I may, um, presently the- uh, I got you, Mr. Jones. Three and a half um, standard has been applied, um, one, because it was the recommendation of SEDOT per their designs and specs, what they would, they would do if they were doing something. Okay, right. when did we start requiring the 3.5? I want to say within the last- Six months. Maybe a little longer than that. Okay. The, okay. Um, and part of that, Madam Chair, is uh, just in, in um, referencing the conflicting provisions uh, clauses of the ZLDR, um, it's kind of a truism that the more 
more restrictive or higher standard within um, conflicting provisions of, of a regulation um, are set forth as the controlling provision. Okay. So when it was determined that the two and six was not yielding anywhere close to a 20 year road and the ZLDR says 20 year road, um, county staff went out to um, determine definitively what a 20 year road um, would be. Okay. This um, reference to SCAPA standards if adopted would kind of formalize that standard, but also provide a lot more guidance and um, <clears throat> particular guidance uh, through the SCAPA manual to uh, the okay. development community. I think we understand okay. all Thank that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tomlinson. Um, so just to clarify, basically, um, I think one of our public comments said it, Mr. Templer, you just said it. So what this does is it increases the quality of our roads, increases the longevity of our roads, right. in turn taking the risk off of the people who have been here, the taxpayer. Absolutely. That, is that a shorthand of what statement. this is? Absolutely. I, I love the taxpayer here, so this is something I'm going to support. And I've been to the CTC meetings. Um, I mean, there's a list of 40 people who some have been waiting 10, 20 years to get their pavement fixed. Um, so that is true about the CTC. Next is Mr. Tucker and then Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think what I was going to say. Thank you for being patient. Chair, no problem. The, uh, I spoke to a couple of the CTC members, commissioners, uh, when I got my agenda last week, and they're in full support of this because of the reasons that were stated of having long, long longevity uh, roads paved and that they're able to stretch their monies, not repeating pavement on subdivisions that have not lived the quality of life that the roads should have. And uh, for those reasons tonight, I will be supporting this. And what I would ask my colleagues too, um, it's just first reading, so what you don't get answered tonight, let's do a little dialogue, a little research, and see can we, um, you know, make amendments or make adjustments, second reading if need be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tucker. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, Quill Hollow has been there how long? Nine, uh, maybe About 20 years plus. Mid-90s. Yeah. Uh, Conor for Acres has been there how long? Probably since before I was born. Yeah. Those roads 1985. Done, those roads have done pretty well. I'm just saying, I, I like what Russ, uh, Councilman Brazos said. Let's, Do we know the thickness on those roads? Well, it would be under the old standard. I mean, but, I mean they might be 3.5. I mean, we don't know. No, they're not 3.5. Can you, can, you, can you tell us? As far as those developments, mm -hmm. no, I cannot tell you that. As far as it, short, short of you know having an I engineering just, firm come out and, and cut cores to check thickness, yeah. I mean, if y'all already y'all want you know somebody to do that, we could probably arrange for that to be done. But obviously, no, the, the uh, roads, yeah, the roads. Yeah. They, they Mr. Work. Jones, how can we ensure that every development does what Conifer Acres and Quail well, Hollow well, does? I think if you look at all the subdivisions and look at their roads, mm -hmm. um, you know, I hear we're talking about a problem, but. I just, uh, I just think it's more bureaucracy. I'm not going to support it, and I would, I would like to ask for more time to look at it. I know, okay. I know some Thank of you. my uh, subdivisions that are newer, uh, their roads are already falling apart. The ones on Black River, um, and those are newer subdivisions that were built within the last 15 years. Yes, they are. Uh, They're under, on the underneath CTC the same agenda. standards. Uh, I don't know if it's different soil type, different location, what it is, but I don't, I don't see why we continue to put the. You know, we sit up here and we talk about being um, stewards of a taxpayer. Okay. We've gotten a plan where we, it is directly said, we're taking the pressure off the taxpayer and we're putting it on. A what about affordable housing? We're, what, we're, what about more bureaucracy? Well, I mean, the you, taxpayer. You, we keep adding and adding and adding, adding more rules and more rules and more regulations and more requirements. And we're uh, just increasing a standard. We're not adding rules and regulations. Well, this we're is increasing always a standard. increasing standards. That's that's. That's a good way to put it. Just like safety for our school buses. I mean, we use we use little trick words like that to make it look like if we're not in favor of it, that uh, we're against safety. I just don't see it as a pressing need at the moment. Mr. Cato. Mr. Temper, question. First of all, question. So I understand this right. The initial cost of the paging, paving project would be on the developer, correct? correct. Okay. So if we're looking at bringing our developments in our county 
to a higher level and to a higher standard, then we ought to be making sure that we bring the roads in those developments to a higher standard and keeping up with the standards. So I'm, I'm going to be in favor of this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Cliff, do you know how much yes, approximately 1.5 inches of payment is per mile? It depends. It depends on your on your on your you know the size of your development. So the larger larger size projects, obviously, are going to be uh, less expensive to, to pay because of the mobilization and bringing all the equipment in mm -hmm. to do the work. Versus smaller scale projects or smaller neighborhoods that are shorter in length, you generally have a cost per ton that's generally higher than than the large scale projects. So okay. It, it, Throwing a number on there without a, you know, actually, okay. you know, cost okay. per lane yeah. mile. You know, I mean, as far as the DOT, $150,000 to $200,000 a, a lane mile. Okay. Or two-inch resurfacing, which is milling two inches and putting back two. So you're doing new construction, so there's no milling. No milling, dollars, okay. So just a matter of uh, placing an additional inch and a half on top. Okay, thank I you. I do thank you for being here, though. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, sir. Even though I don't support it, but thank you very much for your, you know, comments. Well, one more question. So after the paving project is done in these developments, mm -hmm. what is the time period between when it becomes actually becomes the county's issue? Do, is there a warranty on it, a five-year, ten-year? What, what's the warranty between the development, between the development taking care of it and the county's problem? Mr. DeBose. Currently, um, Kershaw County has a one-year um, performance bond guarantee on um, roads and um, it is at a percentage of the total road construction cost but yeah it's a a one-year warranty period um, there have been some discussions about looking at that and tweaking at that but um, um, nothing's obviously been advanced to y'all and there's some consideration about whether that'd be more appropriate in the ZLDR rewrite or as a standalone matter. So okay. if, if we've only got a year warranty, and even if we were to put a three and a half inch asphalt uh, layer down and you got a stump left in the road and it, it takes two years to rot, you're going to get a major pothole. You can't avoid that. That's just poor construction and, and lack of uh, inspection as far as the uh, the engineering or whoever's involved with the, the inspection work on the job, you're just making sure that, that everything is removed when you're talking about a rotting stump or you know, preparing, preparing the subgrade, preparing the, the granular base before you even start paving. All that is very important to, the, to make sure that the project's successful. Here's where I'm at. I'll support it on first reading, but I would like to see the other um, issues addressed as well. And I'd like to do a little bit of, a little bit of research as, as far as to how much it's going to cost and, um, before I support it on second or third. So I appreciate all the information. Yes, Oh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Brazel. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Tucker. I just want to tell Councilman Brazel thank you, and I appreciate the position that he's taken. You're welcome, Sammy. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. <laughs> Mr. Templer, um, for second reading, I'm going to need more data on how many roads we've taken in and are busted up or in need of repairs, how quickly they got to that point. I just need some um, hard data in the county how many roads we're taking on, how quickly, and how many we're, we're having to repair. Because I think that would help this council determine the e extent of the problem. Um, also the cost. Um, and then also a recommendation from your staff if we need to increase that warranty period, please. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right. All those in favor of this first reading of case 24-10, amending our ZLDR to development regulations. Indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I vote yes, Madam Chair. I'm talking okay. to a mute phone. Sorry about that. Okay. Mr. Tucker, <laughs> yes. And all those opposed? Mr. Jones? All right. We'll have that second reading at the first meeting in April. Right, up to item number nine, council member briefings. Um, Mr. Jones, can you start us off tonight, please? I will. You know, I, I just want to give a shout out to Madam Chair. You know, she, we talked about how she'd gotten a promotion 
the, the other day, and I, we're very proud of that. She's in the National Guard. She's thank you, Mr. She's a, a, a veteran, and um, also I, she's going to probably shoot me for this, but she's also been accepted to a school, which is fixed wing school. Am I correct on that? What can you explain what that is? I mean, um, it's not county related, so no, it's not. But I can talk about it. <laughs> It can be county related, but I can talk about it, and uh, and I'm very proud of you on that. You, you know, on your promotion, I'm very proud of you on your service. I'm very proud of you um, <clears throat> getting accepted to that class that I know that was very important to you serving serving our country. And I want to say, as far as myself, whatever you're doing when it comes to your military career and your service to your country, don't you worry about county council. We got your back on that. Well, thank you. I you appreciate know, when that. you're out there serving serving our country in the military. And you can't make a meeting, I got you back. I support you on that. And I've been here 18 years. And uh, I would think the, the large portion of our community, 90% I'd say, uh, support you and would never condemn a uh, member of this council serving their country. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And if they do, I ask them to speak up now. Thank um, you. And this council loves when you run the meetings, too. They so have told me that. And you haven't <laughs> let me forget that <laughs> ever since... Uh, one of made it a Thank of you, minutes. Mr. Jones. I feel the love. I Thank think you. it's more because he can't talk as much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brazel. Are you? <laughs> Mr. Brazel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, hey, I'd like to say that I drove across uh, the Watery River Bridge earlier and both lanes were open. I was pretty excited about that. It's been, it's been a horrific winter. Um, so thanks to, to all the guys at South Carolina Department of Transportation for finally getting that project moving. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say tonight. I, I would like to say to our administrator, thank you for bringing up the, the asphalt situation. Those are things that we're not experts on and might be why I ask a few questions, but um, appreciate all the work that, that you're doing to improve, um, improve the county. So we really do appreciate that, sir. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, uh, this is for everyone, but especially Mr. Temple. Um, <clears throat> I should be in touch with you, hopefully, by the 1st of April. Um, the COG meets um, next Monday, which should be the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. And um, just FYI, we are in myself and the dire COG executive director and uh, CM COG are in conversation on some things. Uh, I won't go into detail because we haven't had final discussion, but we're making some headroads or over there and trying to get things done or at least in the pipe for the west of Watery. With that being said, um, I want to just say for the Finance Committee, uh, we met on the 19th and 21st last week. We are completed with all the elected officials now and uh, we're doing some nonprofit, and we have a meeting this coming Thursday, the 28th at 3.30 at the Government Center for all who wants to attend. Um, other than that, that concludes my report. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Mr. Cato. So just a few things. Um, first of all, this past Friday, we had an opportunity to um, host the Kershaw County Leadership, I think years ago it might have been called Junior Leadership. Um, so there was a few of us that got to attend that with those students, the juniors and seniors from our area high schools. I think every school, every high school in the county was represented. They came here for a brief overview of the county council, and they actually had a malt council meeting, and it was, it was a great time, and uh, I hope it was very informative, and I thank everybody that took the time to put that together. Um, to really, especially uh, Mrs. Amy Counter, she'd done a great job um, arranging this meeting, uh, this mock meeting, and uh, it, it really was, I hope it was informative to the students. Um, also, I want to send out, and there's going to be more on this in the future, but I want to send out a congratulations to the North Central weightlifting team. They are the uh, 2A state champions. They won the state championship in weightlifting, and one of their athletes actually set a 2A state record that had been held for over 30 years by squatting 555 pounds. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have a little bit more on that in the future, but 
but congratulations to them. I hope everybody has a safe weekend. We have the cup on Saturday and Easter on Sunday, so I hope everybody has a safe and enjoyable weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Mr. Tomlinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to be quick and brief. As always, thank you to staff. Thank you to Mr. Templer for all we've put on your plate recently and, and your um, willingness to do all that. Ms. Hannah, thank you as always. Um, feeding the big bucks. That's right. Um, and just as a gentleman brought up earlier in the public comment section, um, I've been working personally with some members of city council to look at developing a Kershaw County um, Equine Advisory Council. Um, so this is something that we're going to be looking at having in the next couple of months coming up. But members from the Equine Park, the South Carolina Equine Park Board, Carolina Racing Cup, Racing Cup Association, uh, Horseman's Council, um, other um, equine-related industry, if they want to come on, and then two appointments each from city and county um, to do that. And I think it's looking at the future, and it's both within our um, strategic plans that we have currently. Um, so that's something that I would like to work uh, directly with Madam Chair and Council Sooner and staff. Yes, better. absolutely. Yep. yep. Two of y'all. That's, yep. that's great. I mean, quicker is better. And then also, I, I know I'd like – there was one thing tonight that just kind of, you know, spoke, and I think it was actually the same gentleman. The impact fees that he mentioned, this Fort Mill, where before he'd mentioned those impact fees were $75,000 or something, that is not related to anything that we can do on council. We are regulated by law, I believe, is uh, based upon census data, um, data for homes and everything, on the amount if we were to do impact fees that we could do. I think right now, once current things come in, maybe 2500 would be our max. Um, I just wanted to put that out there again um, because the 75000 that was mentioned to Fort Mill is not related to anything on impact fees that we have going on. Um, and as Mr. Cato said, thank you again. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody at the Carolina Cup, and happy Easter. Thank you, Mr. Tomlinson. Um, I echo um, what you said about the Equine Park Board. I'm very interested in getting that up and running. Um, thank you to uh, Mr. Graham, who reached out to me um, to get it together. It, it is needed. It is something, um, if this council thinks that I need to serve on it, I absolutely will. Um, but if you're a member of the community interested in serving on that board, please reach out to myself, Mr. Tomlinson, um, or Mr. Graham at the city so we can get that going as soon as possible. I'm going through my notes because I do want to answer some questions from public comments. Bill Kistler, um, the reapplication process. Uh, Mr. DeBose, the applicant for rezoning, once they withdraw their rezoning application, they, do they have to wait a certain time period before they reapply? No. Um, a okay. denial of a rezoning requires a year wait before someone can apply for that same zoning designation okay. that they sought. Um, a withdrawal um, would not pre prevent a reapplication okay. for the same request, but again, the entire process would start over with planning commission, okay. posted notices, et cetera. So to answer Mr. Kistler's question, um, yes, the owner can reapply immediately. He's withdrawn his application and he can reapply. Um, as far as the public posting, um, Mr. Templer, I'm going to add that to your list. Let's make sure we have public postings in adequate locations so the community knows there's a rezoning application in the works. Um, thank you, Stephen Staley. Um, thank you for working with the Johnstons and the Barnetts, the constituents, getting their problems resolved. Um, I've heard nothing but great things about Mr. Staley since he's come on board, so I'm really happy about that. All right. Um, Health Service District of Kershaw County, I want to give them a shout out and to Mr. Brazel. Thank you um, for working with me on getting the grant for um, the park. Um, that was... It went towards a senior, a senior walking trail. They did receive the grant, and they were able to make those upgrades. So thanks for working on that, and thanks to the Health Service District for approving that grant. Um, SCDOT requests, so we had a lot of constituents, and I wrote them down. So I will put the request in at SCDOT myself. But anybody can go to the SCDOT's website and request a traffic study or requ request a stop sign, yield sign, traffic light, Whatever the constituent thinks is the traffic problem, you can go to DOT's website. 
you'll have to submit your personal information, name, email, contact information, but you can request that they look into that. Um, so my feedback to that is as many requests we send to SCDOT, I do think that the greasy wheel will, or the squeaky wheel will get the grease on that. So um, go on that website and let's just keep sending those requests for Ross Road and Highway 1 specifically. White Pond Road, I am tracking the traffic issues there too. Um, so thank you for bringing those to our attention. Mr. John Britton, I did get your email. Um, I did respond. Contact me if you need more information. For council impact fees, um, I am ready to move forward with that and give staff the go ahead to start their pre preliminary work and bring back to us. I think, Mr. Templer, correct me if I'm wrong, staff is kind of waiting to hear something from this council before you spend the money and you do the work on what is needed. Okay, so I'm gonna put that on the agenda for April 9th. Um, just get that in, you know, so we can start thinking about that. But I'm ready to move forward on that one way or the other um, to take action on it. All right, um, I wanna thank Mr. Kurt Arnold um, for his 15 years of service in the assessor's office. He will be retiring um, from Kershaw County service. So thank you, Mr. Arnold. Kershaw County Council meeting clergy prayer schedule. The concerned clergy of Kershaw County has put together a prayer schedule for the rest of the year for county council, and they have a dedicated um, clergy available for us during that week of council. So I just wanna thank them, um, thank, thank you to their involvement with government and everything they do for the people in Kershaw County. That group, they meet every month and they talk about community needs and issues that they are seeing in their churches and their communities. So keep up the good work to the clergy community. Thank you. Last thing, um, this is for Mr. Templer and I, we need to research and get on the bridge repair on Wildwood Lane in Elgin. Um, it's been a couple years that that bridge has been out and we need to get an update from whoever's responsibility is to get that open. So um, that is a segue from Columbia to Elgin. So with all the traffic on the other roads and the growth issue, we need to get that bridge open as soon as possible. All right, that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Templer. Thank you, um, I just have a few things. First off, I just wanna start out by thanking everybody um, that came out to do the, uh, the trash pickup last weekend. Um, I eat, probably saw the orange and green bags everywhere. Also like to thank staff that came out. We, we jumped on Sherrall Road and Park Road, which is out near our spaces at the uh, Park Road landfill. A lot of trash out there. I, I think we ended up with well over 50 bags and it sadly wasn't that long of a distance, but it was just so dense in terms of trash. Um, if anyone sees a, an area on Sherrard Road that has not been picked up, that's where I met the pit bull that charged me. So kind of oh. got out of there. So <laughs> wasn't worth it. So maybe we'll get back there one day. A um, couple other things that were put on. Uh, Mr. Brazel, uh, you'll be happy to know we have a cost opinion for the boat ramp. Um, we've got two options, one with a paved parking lot, one with a gravel parking lot. Um, that first option with the gravel parking lot is totaled at $785,000. If you remember, we had $500,000 from the state from a, uh, a grant, and then we had a $100,000 match. So we're a little short on that, but I think this is a, uh, a really neat project. I think this gives us an opportunity to do something really neat and useful and impactful down at one of our green spaces at the river. Um, it's been mentioned time and time again that um, this is one of the very few, if not one of the, um, well, the only public river access uh, on this side. So we have a neat opportunity to do something there. And I know we're a little short, but um, I look forward to working with council to perhaps um, close that gap and, and make this project happen. So um, we'll, uh, Look at that, and then the uh, the other option with pavement was uh, nine hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars. All right, so we're let me let me write some of this down. Seven hundred eighty, but that's a cost opinion. That's not necessarily a cost. We we're going to go through a bid process. Right, right. So the yes, could potentially come in lower. They usually estimate pretty high. Right. 
And well, this design too, can we make sure we get it out to the folks, the public, so they can see it before we start making a decision? Yes, absolutely. The, get their feedback yeah. on it. Um, it, well, just to that point, we had several public input um, sessions. Uh, Mr. Blanchard went down himself to the, the old boat ramp, and, and we polled people. We asked what you all want, and this is, this is kind of an aggregate of what the uh, public input was. So I feel did the only other I appreciate thing, that. That's good to know. Yeah, it, I, and, and from what I've, uh, what I've seen, it's, it's definitely what I've heard, the, the floating dock being of course, upstream from the from the launch points, uh, being the biggest point of contention, parking. Um, what was the number? I'm sorry, nine. Sure. How, how much was was the cost estimate for the as if we asphalt the parking lot? Nine seventy. Nine seventy. And was that two or three and a half inch asphalt? That is two. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I that was coming. <laughs> I knew it. You know, that, I mean, that old, that, so that number will go up a little bit because it'll be three and a half. Yeah, that old boat ramp was very dangerous. I actually saved a life out there one day. They got sucked under it. It's, pulled it's, them out. That was, my, that was myself. <laughs> myself. <laughs> Listen, um, I'd, I'd like to have a, can we have a, just a short discussion about the boat ramp? I want to make sure that he has a clear Okay. Um, Mr. Templer, is that okay with you? Sure, absolutely. It's your brief. Yes. Okay. And make sure yep. we have a clear year forward, too. So from what he's telling us, it sounds like he thinks he can close the gap financially. Does anybody in this body have a problem with him moving forward with that and, and proceeding to it, the bid I, process, or, or do, we, do we need to make a vote? I I, just, we need to know where the money's going to come from. It needs to be stated, and then we, we need to vote on this. Okay. So I think Mr. Bose can um, jump in if I'm wrong. We've, he's already allocated to spend 600. He would have to go out and get the bids, and if they come, if then it goes over 600, he'll come back to us and tell us how much money he needs. He doesn't need 785 or 970 right now. Oh, you. It's just about, an opinion, you, Mr. Bose. And I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Are you talking about the pave, the pave portion? Or well, the and, and I think that well, that's a, that's the B part of the question. Um, do, do we want to do we want to pave this? Do we want to try to stretch to pave this, or do we want to leave it uh, like a crushing I think, run? And, and that's a very good question. But I, where I'm at, I'd like to see some detail on the money and you know, where the where the extra money is going to come from. I think the gravel with it being along the river and I mean flooding and other things, I think gravel would actually be more economically beneficial. We'd be able to at two inches to put it back on and stuff um what is um patriots landing right now gravel yes. okay so no, okay. do we know if any of the public said they would prefer paved i mean was that any of the public's input okay madam chair yes mr tucker um i would just like to say if we do the um if we do the gravel for now let's make sure that we prep it for the paved so that way we would only need to put a light coat over it whatever it be a sand base or gravel base and then we can pave in the future just don't put a two inch layer there and then when it's time to pave you've got to build up two more inches or whatever that's a good idea mr tucker thank you so that's, gravel for now and then but if he can if he knows pavement later i think, I think we had a, work i think the gentleman in the back would you would you tell us what you heard from the public gerald yeah, Mr. He Blanchard? Was, he was he was nodding his head, and I couldn't understand him. Do you mind coming up and telling us? And I'm sorry to drag I like how out. you say the gentleman from the back. It's um, our deputy administrator, Gerald Blanchard. And how many people you talked to? How many people? Uh, over the four or five days that we were out there, we probably saw 30, 30 good, people at good, different times. Very, very um, primarily, we were over at Patriot Landing in, in that area. Um, actually, um, like Danny and I um, spoke about uh, a few days ago uh, when we were talking about the boat ramp, uh, several people mentioned um, the gravel when they're pulling their boat out. Uh, when they're pulling out, it, tend it has a tendency to yeah. get dirt, and dust, and, and actually mud when it rains on their, their boat, their trailer, their vehicle. So they were actually uh, very adamant about paving uh, the boat ramp, if at all possible. In fact, a couple actually mentioned uh, the Duke uh, boat ramp. That's on the lake side, of course, but uh, but they mentioned the Duke ramp being paved and nice. 
that's all. Okay. That and the, the other thing that was very important to a lot of folks um, were light. It was lighting, and I don't, I'm not sure if that actually is included in this, but security lighting. So okay. per the cost opinion, it's $180,000 difference, which, which is a good bit of money. But I think the added value, I think we'd be done with it. We, it's kind of like moving into your house before you're, you're quite finished with it. You never do finish the last few things. And, and What about security lighting, Russ? I mean, um, how much would that cost, Danny? Did that include that? It didn't, and I would have to look at that because of the, the – um, the, we have power down there, but um, we have to make when the water comes up because obviously this, this area does, is susceptible to high water. That's my only concern with electrical down there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, if it – I will certainly look into that because, to Gerald's point – I can't believe I forgot about the thousand-year flood. So could we – I, I don't want to just, you know, hey, have it my way, but could we could we point them in the direction of taking bids with asphalt, and if the if the monies are available, move forward that way, and that way it's just done. Put it on the Mr. DeBose, do we need to take a vote for him to open up bidding on this project? Six hundred is is budgeted. I mean, if a bid comes in at um, six hundred, obviously the the project could proceed. If additional funding uh, is needed there'd have to be some approval by council for the additional funding um, I don't know that um, you know the expectation when you put it out for bid is that the people bidding on it you know the project is proceeding but it not not a hundred percent of the time so I'm equivocating but um, yeah I think y'all could put it out for bid to see if you um, receive bids within the budget amount or very close to it. We don't need to vote on approving this plan? I think y'all would want to probably approve the plan. I think that'd be a good this idea. This plan out for bid, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can, can, we, can we have that on the next agenda then? I'd like to move, move it forward. I don't no, wanna... I'd like that, yeah. Yeah. I thought we were going to try to vote. And, and, and let's, let's do it with asphalt. Is that agreeable to put it on the agenda with asphalt? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Put Mr. it out the bid. And then with asphalt. Yeah, we can always go lower from there. Yes, Mr. Temper, put it on the agenda how you and staff and the citizens have determined you want it to be. And then April 9th will Madam Chair. Sounds good. And, and that way, once we get bids, we'll know. You know, the I, I feel like cost opinions are always really high. Um uh, we've seen that with, with other things. I feel like they're covering their bases and overshooting a little bit and I think if we get some competitive bids, we may be able to get everything we need. One other thing, the, um, you know, we still have the old, the floating dock from the other location. So that's, that's going to be a, a mitigating kind of circumstance there. So, um, okay. So how do you bid it that way? It just, they'll, they'll, they'll set the iron there and then we'll have that. And then some of it will be new and some will be, Okay, so, so the cost the opinion document. probably, they probably figured using a new dock, didn't they? I'm almost 100% sure. And that's probably, that's probably 100 grand. That's half the asphalt. So let, let's move in that direction if we could, and um, let's get this thing going. Let's get it to bid stage. Well, the folks want it. No question about that. No, no question. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks, Mr. Thank Tucker. You th thank you, Mr. Basil. Sorry to cut you off. Mr. Tucker, did you have something to add? Uh, yes, sir. I was just asking um, the way he got the... Um, folks just now um, because I've seen bids sent out this way before which I'm for the pay but why couldn't you give them the bid on both while they're bidding they can that could be in the bid package bid on the pavement bid on the gravel and that way we have working documents to do what we decide we can find the money for okay that's why he's chairman of the finance committee okay thank you Mr. Tucker so Mr. Templer um, bids on both so that we have comparisons so you okay with that the council Brazil? Not really. I kind of wanted to push that. <laughs> you want to, me to be completely and totally honest, but it's a fair, it's a fair and valid point. Uh, I won't contest. I mean, it. we have to. Yeah, okay, so we we won't have to uh, keep the um, one for the gravel, but it's good to look at just in case money's funny. I just I think that we'll be dumping gravel on it. And 
having a motor grader down there and working on it all the time and people's trash will get down there in the gravel and you'll have to pick the trash up out of the gravel. It's, it's easier to maintain an asphalt parking lot. Right. 20 I'm years. I'm with you on that. Two inches. All right, thank you, Mr. Tucker. Um, back to you, Danny, thank for you. the rest of your brief, please. Um, moving on to the, uh, the sewer expansion project, uh, F met last week with uh, Davis and Floyd. So just wanted to remind you all of some of the target dates. Um, obviously the completion date is the most important because we have ARPA funds that have to be expended by the end of uh, 26. So 6126 is the estimated completion date for construction. In the meantime, um, 4, uh, 4124 will submit for construction permits and applications for uh, stormwater permits through DHEC, um, 7 1, we hope to, of 24, we hope to acquire those permits. And then um, 8 1, we're going out for bids, to, for advertisement for bids. And then 11 1, 24, begin construction. So um, this, this project, there's, there's a lot involved in permitting and designing and things of that nature. But looking at the, the feedback from the, the, the meeting, uh, staff had with Davis and Floyd. There's a lot was discussed, and and so I feel I feel good about this project moving forward. So with uh, as it relates to its its time, um, Woodward Park continuing to move on with that. Um, we've completed a topographic survey, wetlands delineation, uh, design level geotechnical subsurface exploration, um, traffic impact analysis. So, and now we're starting into the architectural engineering design and permitting. Um, so that's, that's just starting to kind of ramp up there. Um, so this, uh, the next rec commission meeting, I excuse me, I think it's on the 8th, we'll be, um, we'll present that design to the Rec Commission for any adjustments they would have uh, some input on, um, I'm sorry, April 3rd, uh, next Wednesday. So they'll review, the committee will review the rendering and make recommendations for any change. Um, I do feel there's opportunity for change for some cost cutting there, but we'll still end up with a really nice project. Um, the next step from there would be the full design of the facility with an architectural kickoff. Um, and on, as it relates to the upper part of the county uh, with Bethune and Mount Pisgah, Alliance is reviewing the proposal for uh, well, Bethune and Westville. Um, we had talked about lighting up there, but there are some field adjustments we're going to make with um, the design of the field and the fencing and moving that. So what we'll want to do is obviously do that before we place lighting. So, um, and I want that to move, at, honestly, at a much quicker pace because I just feel like that is a simpler project on an already existing facility up there. We're just upgrading and reconfiguring the field and installing some nice lights, so. Yes, thank you for making them a priority. Yeah, yeah. so, um, and that is all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. DeBose, legal briefing. Nothing outside of the executive session matters. Okay, up to item number 12. We have three matters on executive session this evening. Is there a motion to enter executive session at this time? Make a motion we enter executive session. Okay, Mr. Cato with the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Tomlinson. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of entering executive session indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote entering executive session? Yes, yeah, Madam Chair. Okay. We are now in executive session, and Chris, if you'll please get.
Okay, is there a motion to come out of executive session? Motion to come out of executive Okay, session. Mr. Brazel with the motion. Second. Mr. Cato with the second. Um, into discussion. Mr. Brazel, Mr. Cato, anything? Nothing. Okay. Um, Council did meet in executive session. We had three issues that we needed to receive a legal briefing on. Um, no votes were taken, and um, we will have action once we come out. All those in favor of getting out of executive session, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote coming out of executive session, yay or nay? I vote yes, Madam okay. Chair. All right, we are out of executive session at this time. I move that we authorize the administrator to initiate condemnation actions as needed in connection with the county's Southern Loop sewer project as discussed in executive session. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Brazel. Um, into discussion, this is a necessary uh, motion so that we can complete the Southern Loop project. And Mr. Templer, can you remind us how much money we have? the county has um, invested in the Southern Loop project? It's close to six million dollars through okay. the phases, the various phases over the years. Okay. And what phase are we in now? I think this is two A. Okay. Two A. Yeah. If I could. Yes, Mr. Jones. I, I will be voting against this to stay in tradition with how I feel about condemnation and taking someone else's property. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Questions for the administrator? Mr. Tucker? Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right. All of those in favor of authorizing the administrator to take action as needed in connection with the Southern Loop sewer project, condemnation action, as discussed, discussed in executive session, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel. Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I'll vote yes. Okay. Mr. Tucker is yay. And all those opposed? Mr. Jones. Back to the agenda. Item number 13, oh, adjourn. Sure. Is there a motion to adjourn? So Mr. Moved. Tucker with the motion. Mr. Tomlinson. Second. Second. All those in favor. Any discussion? Mr. Jones. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All those in favor of adjournment, indicate by raising your hand. Mr. Jones, Mr. Tomlinson, Mr. Cato, myself, Mr. Brazel, and Mr. Tucker, how do you vote? I, I vote yes. Okay. Mr. Tucker is yay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.